Today, we are going to check out the Fort Hill estate and learn about John C. Calhoun and Thomas Green Clemson, as well as others. So let's go do it. Hello everybody, and thank you for checking out my latest video. I'm in Clemson, South Carolina to look at the Fort Hill Estate and the history associated with this location and take a tour of the home. Fort Hill is unique in many ways. For one, it is located on the campus of Clemson University, but that's not all. When discussing the history of Fort Hill, the story pretty much starts and ends with the Calhoun family. And so, we will start by talking about John Caldwell Calhoun. John C. Calhoun was born in the Abbeville District of South Carolina on March 18th in 1782 and died on March 31st, 1850 in Washington, D.C. at the age of 68. His family was relatively wealthy. His father, Patrick, was a landowner, owned slaves, was a judge, and served in the state legislature. His father was a firm believer in states' rights and personal liberties. John C. Calhoun would inherit these beliefs from his father. As a boy, there were not many schools in the area for Calhoun to attend. I did read where he briefly attended an academy in Appling, Georgia. Appling is located in Columbia County, Georgia. The academy apparently shut down soon after Calhoun enrolled, but he did return once the academy reopened. Calhoun attended Yale University in 1802 and graduated in 1804. He studied rhetoric philosophy, and mathematics. In 1805, Calhoun was admitted to Litchfield Law School in Litchfield, Connecticut, and was admitted to the bar in 1807. He did practice law briefly, but found it boring. He turned to politics, and here he found his lifelong career. John C. Calhoun was elected to his first political office in 1808 when he won a seat in the South Carolina legislature, representing Abbeville. In 1811, Calhoun married his second cousin, Floride Bonneau Calhoun. Floride's mother owned the land and small four-room house that would eventually become Fort Hill. Floride's father, had passed away in 1802. He was very wealthy and owned a large amount of land and also owned over a hundred slaves at the time of his death. John C. and Floride were married in Charleston, South Carolina. It was not unusual during this period for cousins to marry. The marriage and the inheritance that he received from his father secured his financial status. As I mentioned, Floride's mother owned the land that John and Floride would call home. The land had originally been owned by John Ewing Calhoun and then was owned briefly by Reverend James McElhenney and his wife Elizabeth. The McElhenneys purchased the land in 1802, the same year John Ewing Calhoun passed and built a four-room house on the property. Shortly after building their home, Reverend McElhenney passed away, and soon after, the land was purchased by Mrs. John Ewing Calhoun. And by the way, her name was also Floride, same as her daughter, who married John C. John C. Calhoun was elected to the United States House of Representatives in 1811 and served until 1817. He then served as Secretary of War from 1817 
until 1825 in the administration of President James Monroe. Once President Monroe's term ended, Calhoun briefly ran for President of the United States. He soon realized that his chance to win was remote. He changed course and ran for Vice President. He thought by being the Vice President that would increase his odds of winning the presidency in the future. Calhoun was elected Vice President and served under President John Quincy Adams from 1825 until 1829. Calhoun was again elected as Vice President serving under President Andrew Jackson from 1829 until 1832. While Calhoun was Vice President under Andrew Jackson, Floreed Calhoun led a social boycott of Peggy Eaton, who was the wife of Jackson's Secretary of War, John Eaton. The allegation was that John and Peggy had engaged in an adulterous affair while Peggy was still married to her first husband. Floreed Calhoun organized the other cabinet members' wives against Miss Eaton. Their organization was called the Petticoats. They deemed Miss Eaton's actions unladylike and refused to associate with her. President Jackson stood by John Eaton and this incident ended all cordial relations between Jackson and his vice president. Another major disagreement between Jackson and Calhoun would occur concerning federal tariffs that imposed high taxes on imported goods, which impacted southern states severely. South Carolina, as well as other southern states, felt that they were being unfairly targeted and threatened to succeed from the Union if the tariff was not repealed. Standing on the Ordinance of Nullification, the state of South Carolina on November 24, 1832, declared the tariffs of 1828 and the slightly modified 1832 version to be null and void and no law, nor binding this state, its officers, or citizens. The nullification doctrine basically said that the states retained the authority to determine when the federal government exceeded its powers and they, meaning the states, could declare federal acts to be void and of no force in the state's jurisdiction. John Calhoun worked behind the scenes with his home state in drafting this ordinance of nullification. President Jackson wasted little time in his response to South Carolina. In his proclamation to the people of South Carolina, he stated the supremacy of the federal government and warned that disunion by armed force is treason. No other southern states would join South Carolina in this attempted power play against the federal government, and South Carolina rescinded its ordinance of nullification. Citing policy differences with President Jackson, Calhoun resigned the vice presidency on December 28, 1832. He was the only vice president to resign from office until Spiro Agnew did so on October 10, 1973. Agnew was Richard Nixon's vice president. At some point, Floreed Calhoun came to dislike the idea of trying to raise a family in Washington, D.C., and eventually began to spend more time at Fort Hill. And as a result, she and John C. were separated from each other while he served in Washington. After resigning the vice presidency, Calhoun was elected to the United States Senate from South Carolina in 1833. In the Senate, Calhoun continued to defend the institution of slavery. During a debate on the Senate floor concerning abolition, Calhoun declared that slavery was not evil, but rather a positive good. Calhoun said during the debate that never before has the black race of Central Africa, from the dawn of history to the present day, attained a condition so civilized 
and so improved, not only physically, but morally and intellectually. In March of 1843, Calhoun resigned his Senate seat. Calhoun was 60 years old. At this time, Calhoun would again try to become the Democratic Party presidential nominee. This attempt never got off the ground, and he withdrew his candidacy in the summer of 1843. He returned to Fort Hill. In February of 1844, President John Tyler appointed Calhoun to be his Secretary of State. The office had been held by Abel P. Upshur, but he was tragically killed during an explosion aboard a Navy warship. Calhoun filled the unexpired term that ended in 1845. Calhoun was again elected to the United States Senate from South Carolina in 1845. During this time, Calhoun was opposed to the Mexican-American War and abstained when the measure was brought for vote in the Senate. Calhoun also opposed the Wilmot Provision Act that would prohibit slavery in the land that was acquired from Mexico. Calhoun's continued pro-slavery stance was not popular on a national level, but during his career, Calhoun was an avid supporter of slavery and believed individual states should have the right to resolve the matter without interference from the federal government. John Caldwell Calhoun died on March 31, 1850 in Washington, D.C. from tuberculosis. He was buried in Charleston, South Carolina. His wife wanted him to be buried on the estate grounds, and I feel sure that's what he would have wanted. But I have read that his burial was handled as an affair of the state, and the powers that be decided he would be buried in Charleston. His wife, Floreed, and their children are buried in St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Pendleton, South Carolina. John and Floreed had 10 children, seven lived to adulthood. Because of his pro-slavery views, in February of 2017, Yale University decided to remove Calhoun's name from a building on their campus. Also, in June of 2020, Clemson University voted to remove John C. Calhoun's name from the Honors College on their campus. Also, in June of 2020, the statue of John C. Calhoun was removed from the square in downtown Charleston, South Carolina. I know this background on John C. Calhoun was a bit long, but I feel it is necessary in order to have a better understanding of the Fort Hill estate. Of all those that lived in the mansion, John C. Calhoun, in my opinion, is the most notable. Now let's take a look at the mansion. The house is Greek Revival with federal detailing. I am no expert, but I did do some research, and Greek Revival typically means houses that have columns, pediments, porticos, and wide friezes. As far as the federal detailing, that includes the home being square or rectangular in shape and being two or three stories high and two rooms deep. Fort Hill meets all of these characteristics as far as I can tell. Here is some video of the house taken from the front lawn that shows some of the landscaping of the property. This is the kitchen and as you can see it is detached from the house. It was not unusual for kitchens to be separate from the house during the 1800s as it was a safety precaution due to potential fires. It is connected to the house by a breezeway. The current kitchen is a reconstruction of the original. It was not open on the day that I was there. Here is an image of the east entrance to the mansion. 
This shows more of the Greek columns that are a trademark of Fort Hill. You can also see two of the chimneys that are a prominent part of the house. Here is the rear of the home and you can also see part of the formal gardens located in this area. This is really a very beautiful part of the grounds and there is a unique story behind this area of the property. The flower garden in this area is called Cornelia's Garden, named after John C. and Floride's youngest daughter, Martha Cornelia Calhoun. When Cornelia was 12 years old, she fell from a swing and suffered a severe spinal cord injury. John C. had the garden planted with various plants and flowers so Cornelia would have a pleasant place to spend time outside. Also located about 50 feet from the rear of the house is John C. Calhoun's private office and library. He did much of his political writings and other government work here. It provided him a quiet place to gather his thoughts and to contemplate the issues of the day and also manage the plantation. The office contains his vice presidential desk, his Senate chair, as well as his legislative desk and other items of note from his career. The office was not open on the day that I was there. Also included in the area of Cornelia's garden is this sundial. You don't see these every day and I thought it was very interesting and wanted to include it in the video. When I took my tour of Fort Hill, I was told that over 90% of the furnishings and items in the house are original. That is really amazing. It certainly is a step back in time. So keep in mind, what you see in the video and the photographs are probably original. When you walk into the front door of Fort Hill, you're in the front hallway. This area is part of the original four room structure known as Clergy Hall. That was the home of Reverend James McElhenney and his wife, as I mentioned earlier. There are many photographs in this area and the archway that you see indicates the end of the original structure and start of the expansions by the Calhouns. The wallpaper in the hallway is a reproduction of the 19th century American wallpaper that includes French borders that was present here in 1825 until 1854. The master bedroom is located on the first floor. The bed, which is called an empire bed, was made by William Knopf, who was from nearby Pendleton, South Carolina. The quilt on the bed was made by Martha Cornelia Calhoun. As I said earlier, she was the youngest daughter of the Calhouns. That is a portrait of Floride Calhoun above the bed that was painted in 1840. This room also includes John C. Calhoun's reclining chair as well as his traveling trunk, which has his initials on it. The dress you see is an example of what was worn at the time. And also, the piano was one of several owned by Floride Calhoun. The room you see in the back of the master bedroom was the children's room, and was later the bedroom for Martha Cornelia Calhoun after her accident. This bedroom was easier for her to access as opposed to using the stairs for the second floor. The formal dining room is also located on the first floor. The table seats 12 and was brought to Fort Hill from Washington, D.C. after Calhoun's tenure as Secretary of War. The table is made from African mahogany and the chairs are made from tiger maple. They both were designed by Duncan Fife, who was one of the leading cabinet makers of the 19th century. The table is set with a replica of the Andrew Jackson era White House china. The silver is original 
and was presented to the Calhouns by the French government. The sideboard was made from wood of the officers' quarters of the USS Constitution, also known as Old Ironsides. That is a coffee urn that sits on top of the sideboard. The dining room also contains portraits of John C. Calhoun, Floride Calhoun, Anna Maria Calhoun Clemson, Thomas Green Clemson, as well as others. The parlor is also located on the first floor and was built in 1827. One of the many interesting items in this room is the signature in the plaster of the wall of the Calhoun's oldest son, A.P. Calhoun. This can be found on the section of wall by the door as you enter. The parlor is also the room where Anna Maria Calhoun and Thomas Green Clemson were married. The parlor contains many portraits and bust of the Calhoun and Clemson family members. There is also candelabras, various fine ceramics, antique furniture, and musical instruments. This chair is referred to as the Royal Chair. The chair was a gift to Thomas Green Clemson from King Leopold of Belgium. Clemson served as a United States diplomat to Belgium from 1844 through 1851. In the chair is a violin and painter's palette that belonged to Clemson. Thomas Clemson was a very talented violinist and piano player and also composed music. He also excelled at painting and some of his works are on display at Fort Hill. The chair located in front of the parlor fireplace is from Mount Vernon and belonged to George Washington. It is believed to be one of Washington's camp chairs from the Revolutionary War. One of Thomas Clemson's sisters married into the Washington family and by that connection, this chair made its way to Fort Hill. Also, this couch came from Mount Vernon, again due to Clemson's connection to the Washington family. The couch is made of horsehair and mahogany wood. That is a sawfish blade resting on the couch. The parlor also contains two pianos that belong to Floride Calhoun. This piano is the last one that she purchased, and I have read that it is the only one in the residence that is still playable. And this piano is a Gunther Norwood Piano Forte. I read that Piano Forte technically describes all pianos, but a player could control the loudness of this type of piano much easier by pressing the keys softer or harder. Piano Forte is Italian for quiet, loud. I would like to take a moment to talk more about Thomas Green Clemson. Besides what I have already mentioned, Clemson was also an agriculturist, studied agricultural chemistry, mineralogy, and served in the Confederate Army during the American Civil War. Because of his marriage to Anna Maria Calhoun, he of course became a member of the Calhoun family and spent many hours at Fort Hill. Eventually, Anna Maria inherited Fort Hill and most of the land associated with it. In 1872, Thomas and Anna moved to Fort Hill. Anna died of a heart attack on September 22, 1875, at the age of 58. She willed her land, including Fort Hill, to Thomas, with the stipulation that he would have a will at the time of his death. After Anna's death, Thomas and his lawyers drew up his will. I have read that both Thomas and Anna had hoped 
that a college would one day be built on the property. Thomas Clemson died of pneumonia at the age of 80 on April 6, 1888. His will stated that Fort Hill and the surrounding property, plus $80,000, would be given to the state of South Carolina to establish an agricultural college on the property. On November 27, 1889, the South Carolina Legislature approved the formation of the Clemson Agricultural College of South Carolina. In March of 1964, the school changed its name to Clemson University. The Fort Hill residence is located on the campus. Now let's go upstairs for a quick look at the bedrooms located there. These stairs lead to the second floor and offer a look at more original furnishings that add to the history of Fort Hill. This is the southeast bedroom. The bedroom is associated with the Calhoun's oldest son, Andrew Pickens Calhoun. The painting above the bed is of Queen Victoria and her Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. There are plenty of paintings in the room, along with an impressive display of furniture that includes a grandfather clock and what looks to be a type of four-poster bed. And the chair to the right of the bed looks to have a similar color scheme as the wallpaper. This room is the northeast corner bedroom and was the bedroom of Patrick Calhoun another of the Calhoun sons, who was also a West Point graduate. Here you will find paintings by Thomas Clemson, including the one above the fireplace called Madonna and Child. His wife, Anna Maria, and daughter, Nina, were models for this painting. The sleigh bed is of mahogany wood that was purchased in Europe by the Clemsons. The chest on chest that you see at the end of the bed and against the wall was used as a linen press. Next is the northeast center bedroom. This bedroom probably was used by the Calhoun's third son and after the death of John C. Calhoun, his wife Floride moved into this room. The paintings you see were part of Thomas Clemson's art collection. The painting you see of the chickens was painted by Clemson. The bonnet chest is made of walnut and belonged to Thomas Clemson. The maple acorn bed was owned by the Calhoun family. The bust you see on the bonnet chest is of Mars, the god of war. This room is thought to be part of the original structure built in 1803 by Reverend Michael Henney. One other room upstairs I would like to show you is the dressing room. The upstairs actually has two of these rooms. They were used to groom and bathe. The tub on the left is called a hip bathtub. You would sit in the tub and bathe yourself and I have read that variations of these tubs are still used today. The tub on the right is called a hat tub. A person would stand in the tub while another person would pour water over their head and body. Excess water would be caught by the brim. The travel trunk belonged to Thomas Green Clemson. I really hope you enjoyed this video on Fort Hill, John C. Calhoun, and Thomas Green Clemson. Certainly, if you are in the Clemson, South Carolina area, be sure and check out the Fort Hill Estate. I don't think you will be disappointed. If you did enjoy this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. It will help my channel greatly. I will have another video out soon, and until then, have a great day.